G'day class, let's go ahead and pick up where we left off in the last class session. So during the last class, we were talking about revisions to traditional views of science, uh, looking at empirical observations, theory formulation, testing, revision, prediction and control, search for lawful relationships, and the assumption of determinism. So now we're looking at Karl Popper's adds to it, it's his particular view. According to Karl Popper, science starts with recognition of a problem which determines what observations are to be made, propose solutions or conjectures, and find fault with solutions or refutations. Thus, science involves problems, theories or proposed solutions, and criticism. A scientific theory must be refutable, the principle of falsifiability. So, the way Karl Popper sees it, falsification is a line in the sand. It is a demarcation between a scientific and a non-scientific theory. He emphasizes it's not between a useful and useless theory. So something can be non-scientific and still has some usefulness to it. According to Karl Popper, he said Freud's theory was unscientific because it violated the principle of falsification. For a theory to be scientific, it must specify observations that, if made, would refute the theory. So it need to have the ability to be proven wrong. So continuing with Karl Popper's view of science, theories must make risky predictions. Predictions that run a risk of being incorrect. Post-diction can be easy. Post-diction is explaining phenomena after they have already occurred. It's like the term Monday morning quarterbacking after the football games have been played on Sunday. Someone around the water cooler says the coach should have called this play as opposed to the one he did. Well, now that you already know what the outcome is, it's obvious that you can sort of readjust your thinking and memory to say that you would have done things differently. So post-diction explains phenomena after they have already occurred. And Freud did a lot of this. All theories will eventually be replaced by more adequate theories. Science is an unending search for better solutions to problems or better explanations of phenomena. Now I want to note that in your notes, uh, some slides that appear there are not going to be covered in this particular presentation. I'll bring those back in chapter two where they probably are better suited. So our next slide then becomes, is psychology a science? Researcher, researchers have observed lawful relationships between classes of environmental events and classes of behavior and devise rigorous refutable theories. So from that perspective, it's looking quite good for psychology being a science. Now, let's look at determinism. Can things be determined? All behavior has causal explanations. Someone does something, there's a reason behind them doing that. Now, let's look at a variety of types of determinism here. We have biological determinism, which emphasizes the importance of physiological conditions and or genetic predispositions and explanation of behavior. We have environmental determinism, emphasizes the importance of environmental stimuli as determinants of behavior. And of course, social cultural determinism, emphasizes cultural or societal rules regulations, customs, and beliefs that govern human behavior. So, the common characteristic of these three determinisms is that the determinants are directly measurable. They're physical determinism. Physical determinism, genes, environmental stimuli, cultural customs are used to explain human behavior and they have some objectivity to them. As opposed to psychical determinism, where we have mental causes, conscious or unconscious influences on behavior. So, indeterminism and non-determinism. Uncertainty principle. You may have heard of this during your travels so far. Heisenberg's principle applied to psychology. States that we can never learn at least some causes of behavior because in attempting to observe them, we change them. Human behavior may be determined, but the causes cannot be accurately measured. Non-determinism. 
Some researchers reject science as a way of studying humans. They just say it can't be done. Human behavior is freely chosen, self-generated. We have free will. And because of that, then we are the captains of our ship. We do our own thing. Now, of course, that can cause problems. We do think of psychology as a science. So what's the reality here? Determinism and responsibility. Taking this a little bit of an aside here to see what this actually means if we carry it to the, the, the higher level here. Free will leads to personal responsibility for behavior. So if you have free will, then you are responsible for your behavior. Hard determinism. Hardcore determinism causes function in an automatic, mechanistic manner. Thus, the notion of personal responsibility is meaningless. Everything is determined. Self-determinism. Cognitive processes intervene between experience and the production of behavior. And this result, human behavior is a result of thoughtful deliberation of options available. Thus, a person is responsible for actions. So obviously that last few slides there can be a little bit trippy to a degree, uh, but the idea is that in psychology we do talk about determinism. It's a key thing. Otherwise we wouldn't be having this conversation. The field of psychology would not be what it is today. We do believe things can be determined. We can find causes to our behavior. Now, going a little bit deeper into some of the items that were covered in chapter one, uh, we talk about rationalism versus empiricism. The chapter one starts off with the empiricist view, and then we look at Karl Popper's discussion of it. So let's talk about these two ideas here, rationalism and empiricism. What is the extent to which we are dependent upon sense experience and our effort to gain knowledge? How much do we rely on our senses? to know things around us, to know how things work in the world. Rationalists claim that there are significant ways in which our concepts and knowledge are gained independent of sense experience. That we can know things and gain knowledge without having to experience things with our senses. Empiricists claim that sense experience is the ultimate source of all our concepts and our knowledge. Logical positivism. Systematic reduction of all human knowledge to logical and scientific foundations. That's what logical positivism is about. The systematic reduction of all human knowledge to logical and scientific foundations. Thus, a statement is meaningful only if it is either purely formal, based on mathematics or logic, or capable of empirical verification. We can go out and see it, observe it. The main tenets is this, are this. The opposition to all metaphysics as having no meaning. The rejection of synthetic a priori propositions. For example, all bachelors are happy, which are by their nature unverifiable. As opposed to analytical statements, which are true simply by virtue of their meanings. All bachelors are unmarried. True statement. That's the definition. The idea that all knowledge should be codifiable in a single standard of language of science. That's one of the goals that we see here. Logical positivism, all human knowledge. Logical and scientific foundation can be reduced to that. Logical and scientific foundations. Logical positivism developed from what they call the Vienna Circle. It divided science into empirical and the theoretical. It wedded empiricism and rationalism together. Accepting theory as part of empirical science, however, it did not reduce the importance of empirical observation. Abstract theoretical terms were allowed only if such terms could be logically tied to empirical observations. This should sound somewhat familiar to you. Now we're talking about operationism. The insistence that all abstract scientific terms be operationally defined. Okay, so we have heard this term before, the operational definition, how you operationally define something. So an operational definition is the defining of an abstract theoretical concept by the procedures used to measure it. 
Operational definitions tie theoretical terms to observable phenomena. No ambiguity about the definition of the theoretical term. The Bandura studies of social learning theory, Bandura studies about the Bobo doll, they had to operationally define what aggressiveness was. So they operationally defined what aggressiveness was by saying the number of time, times a child would hit, kick, scream, bite, slap the Bobo doll. That would be logically tied to this idea of aggressiveness. Therefore, now we have it operationally defined. Once operationism was presented, most psychologists agreed with the logical positivists that unless a concept can be operationally defined, it is scientifically meaningless. So, physicalism. Science is content is not actual or potential sensations, but instead is entities publicly observable. It's about observation. The desire for the unification of and a common vocabulary among the sciences, including psychology. One outcome of logical positivism was that all sciences were viewed as essentially the same, following the same principles, with the same assumptions, and with all attempting to explain empirical observations. Why shouldn't they use the same terminology? Characteristics. The combination of behaviorism and logical positivism is neo-behaviorism. Though there were major differences among the neo-behaviorists, they all tended to agree on a few important issues. If theories are used, they must be used in ways demanded by logical positivism. All theoretical terms must be operationally defined. Again, makes sense for behaviorists because it makes it concrete. It makes it objective. We now have something that we can measure, which as we'll see, and as you already know, uh, when it comes to behaviorism, that's one of the key things, particularly when it comes to the hardcore behaviors. They need to have something that they could measure, they could count. So there, though there were major differences among the neo-behaviors, they all tend to agree with a few important issues. Non-human animals should be used as research participants for two reasons. Relevant variables are easier to control in animals than when using human subjects. And of course, when we talk about experimentation, control is a key factor. Perceptual and learning processes in non-human animals differ only in degree from those processes in humans. So we still can learn a lot from the animals. Three, information gained from research with non-human animals can be generalized to humans. As we know, and as we'll see again, uh, when it comes to behaviorism, a lot of the research that we know about behaviorism initially was done with animals. Learning processes are of prime importance because learning is the primary mechanism by which organisms adjust to the changing environment. So let's go to another thing also mentioned in this first chapter that we've covered, verificationism. Verificationism is the view that the meaning of a statement is the conditions under which it is verified. The experience is such that if you have them, then the statement is true. So let's look at one of the problems that were mentioned uh, in the first chapter as well. Science and induction and problem of induction. Science, and we assume causation, causal and effect relationships. For empiricists, all the evidence there is for empirical knowledge, including science, concerning matters of fact, is sensory experience. For some, we move from individual experiences, singular statements, to generalizations, universal statements, using induction, and we do this often. Now, here are some of the empirical generalizations based on that. Millions of ravens have been observed, and all are black. A non-black raven has never been observed. Therefore, all ravens are black. Are, like other forms of inductive arguments, amplitive, meaning extending or adding to that which is already known. Reasoning moves from the past to the present to the future. 
This is what we've seen in the past. This is what we're seeing now. And therefore, it will continue in the future. From what has been experienced to what has not been experienced. David Hume, who we'll see a lot more in a future chapter, David Hume questioned this. What justifies our use of induction? There he imagines two possibilities. Experience, which concerns matters of fact, and reason, which concerns relations of ideas. And he proposes that we explore each to see if the justification lies there. The inference. What does my past or present knowledge about some kind of object suggest about my next encounter with that kind of object? Put another way, propositions of the form, what we have all experienced that X causes Y and X will always cause Y are very different. What justifies such, such the inference from the first to the second? What we have all experienced that X causes Y. True. We've all experienced that. And then we go to the next one. X will always cause Y. That's a much bigger statement. So there is no necessary connection between them. I've always experienced that X causes Y. I foresee that the next X I encounter will cause Y. It is logically possible that however many my experiences of X causing Y, it won't next time or next week or next July. Inductive arguments are not deductively valid.